Okay, we are live. We are live, live, live. Just making sure this is all working just fine. We had that, we had one of those unusual technical difficulties again today. If you can see, uh, the technical difficulty was uh, me sleeping through my alarm once again. It has been known to happen before, but welcome, to beautiful people. Thanks if you've stuck around to tune in, and thanks especially to my guests for sticking around to to continue to chat with me. Um, that's been uh, that's been pretty cool. Um, I am looking forward to hearing your comments if you're able to join us live. Um, and if, but of course, if you can't do that, we are now putting up archive episodes on YouTube. So all you have to do is search on YouTube for beautiful people vidcast and all this technology. Boy, I'm flooding myself with it. I am beginning to. Um, do podcast versions as well because people want to just hear the audio. They'd rather not see the video. And, you know, looking at these eyes, I can understand why. Um, so the podcast is available too. Um, it was uh, up on Podbean for a couple of days, but now it's on anchor.fm slash beautiful people. Uh, and it will be on all your uh, other podcast feeds as well. Uh, Apple podcasts and Google podcasts over the next few days, I reckon. So without further ado, I would like to uh, uh, say thank you very much to our guests for staying on. And uh, the mystery is about to be revealed uh, from the deep south in Louisiana. I am speaking with uh, Worth Thompson. How are you, Worth? Fine. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much for sticking around. I'm, I'm so sorry for, the, for, for sleeping in. You were the first. I never apologized for Does that creep you out at all? Not a bit. <laughs> Very good. So we only have met for the first time as Big Country fans very briefly. Um, have you always been a Big Country fan? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, my first exposure, like most Americans, was uh, on MTV to Big Country. Uh, did not get a lot of radio play in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at the time, or for that matter, ever. Uh, so seeing them on TV was a big deal. And to be perfectly honest with you, as big an influence as MTV may have been, I think, in, at least in America, something that was underrated was the USA Network. They had a show called Radio 1990 that would appear uh, – on the weekdays at 5.30 p.m. And they would do the most popular song of that day. So it's a very interesting thing that I used to watch that show, hoping, and I'm embarrassed to admit this at this point, that they would play A Flock of Seagulls. And inevitably, <laughs> Big Country was a far more popular band during that show, or when I was watching it, and they would play snippets of the video and, I just didn't like them because they weren't a flock of seagulls. But after about a week of that, I just started listening. And the video was cool. For Obviously, it was in a big country. And at that point, how does it not get infected into your, into your conscience and into your heart? And that's exactly what happened to me. So initially, I did not get or understand the music as a 13-year-old. But then it just happened it just was there and how do you not love what they've done so that that was my introduction and i really think that show radio 1990 and then another program that came on called night flight on fridays really gave big country far more exposure than mtv ever did so i'm not really sure if very many people remember that probably definitely not internationally maybe some people in the U.S. and Canada. But for me, that they were far more influential in Big Country's popularity than MTV ever was. Well, at least you stopped running and started listening to um, Big Country. Sorry, I had to get a flock of seagulls type of 
line in there, but no, nah, didn't work. Sorry. Didn't Interesting. Work. Yeah, Stewart's haircut and Mike Score's haircut eventually turned out to be the same. If you take a look. I, I can I get one of the viewers to do that? Put a comparison picture up of the two, please. It, it would be when Mike went to just the regular kind of Stewart puffed out haircut, but it. It was actually, it's actually interesting to look because it's very similar. Not the iconic flock of seagulls here. Though. So tell us a bit about um, your, your childhood growing up. Have you always been in the South? Um, you're in Louisiana now. Have you always been there? Um, uh, I grew up, what was, what, what yeah. was your kind of musical influence before you discovered big country? Uh, well, of- growing up, my parents were very, very uh, old. My parents were much older when they had me. So in my house, there was a lot of big band music, uh, particularly the Russ Morgan Orchestra. So I listened to a great deal of big band. Uh, Obviously, my consciousness of music came about during the disco era. And I don't know too many people from rural backgrounds. I grew up in a small town called Clinton, Louisiana, with about 2,000 people that you tend to follow whatever's popular because you don't have any type of underground scene or, you know, really cool music shops or record shops. So you just kind of followed that. And then um, I always lived there until I moved. Uh, after I got married, I married a Belgian woman who was teaching in Louisiana. I'm a teacher. I've been doing that for 26 years. And she was, uh, came on a, program called Codafil, which is to help redevelop our French language culture in Louisiana. We got married and we taught in the International Baccalaureate Curriculum or IB, which is a kind of a worldwide curriculum. And we ended up moving overseas. So for two years, we lived and worked in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And from there, we moved to Lalongwe, Malawi in Southern Africa. So my ex-wife in Southern Africa decided she didn't want to be married anymore. And I can't just hang out in Africa without a job. So I had to come back home. But uh, we have two children, which I have to give a shout out. I've got to do this. I'm going to go ahead and get all of them out of the way. Alex and Emma. uh, My son, Alex, is a junior in high school at Geneva, Switzerland. My daughter, Emma, has just started in um, Belgium. In university, she's fluent in French and English. Both of my children are. So I couldn't be more proud of them. And my daughter will begrudgingly admit to being a bit of a big country fan. <laughs> but also we will say hello to my sister, who used a big country quote in her senior picture in high school. And my special friends, Jamie and Amanda and Jim and Pam and my golf buddies, the Rat Pack. But also my very best friend and huge big country fan, as big a big country fan as I am, I introduced this big country to him, and that's my best bud, Dr. Hatcherton. So I, did, I had to get all those names in because I wouldn't have forgiven myself if I hadn't, so I apologize. <laughs> no, you're right. Absolutely no problem at all. It's- but the, 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 typically, you just would, where I grew up, you listen to popular radio. So when I got a driver's license at 15, I had already become a big country fan, but they were not popular on the radio. So I wore cassette tapes out just left and right. Yeah. Yeah. I did that too, especially when I got my first car and I could, uh, I could drive around with the music. Other than that, I was a bit more of a vinyl person. Just a shout out to a few people, Pete. Um, Pete is listening. PK, uh, Dan, Stuart, Keith, Kenny. Good to see you, Kenny. Uh, Dan. Dan is from South Wales in the UK. So we have got people watching from all over the place. Um, so it's good to have you uh, have you on the stream with us, guys. So if you've got any questions for Worth, please feel free to ask. And what grabbed my attention is I'm, a, I'm very passionate about travel as well. And it sounds like you've got some very interesting travel stories. And when you stood up before, before we went on air, there was a, an African style shield on the wall behind you. Um, it caught my attention. And actually, I don't know if that was visible. No, it wasn't. Let's do that again. Yep, now we can see it. Um, so there we go. 
that shield on the wall caught my attention. And when you came back and sat down, I mentioned that and you said there's a big country story to tell behind that shield. Tell us about that. Well, that's, and I probably did not lead you correctly in that. The shield is not really the story. Uh, I bought that at the Lalongwe market and when living in Lalongwe in Malawi, I contracted malaria and almost died of it. So I just make sure you use a, some sort of prophylactic if you're ever in a malaria zone, because trust me, it's not something you want to do. But on the way to taking me to the doctor for hospitalization, we stopped at the local grocery store, which they had just installed a brand new speaker system. And the song we pulled up to was in a big country, the long version, including Mark's intro, famous intro. So it was the album version. And uh, I think I got out of the hospital a few days later and bought that shield, but that was um, just to find big country being played in the Chipiku supermarket in a long way in Malawi is just not something you would ever expect to encounter. Yeah, so I I thought it was a thrill hearing big country play in a service station in Queensland, but to hear them like that <laughs> in an African country, yeah, that would have been that would have been interesting. It was surreal. Uh, not something I ever expected to happen. And they obviously had it on a loop because I went back to the store, you know, at least once or twice a week to get groceries. And I would hear it fairly often. So they, they had a, a playlist, but, but this was a prominent feature, was, was Big Country, which was really neat. And they were always wondering where those royalty checks were coming from in Africa and why they were coming? Well, I think the the probably the... Currency exchange is killing them on that. So I don't think they can make a living with them. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time you got into big country, you were listening to flock of seagulls. What, what else were you listening to? What Anything that was playing on MTV. Uh, also a lot of guitar driven rock, a lot of the things like scorpions and except I very quickly lost a taste for any sort of keyboarder synthesizer music, despised Duran Duran. Uh, didn't like any of the Depeche Mode or anything. So anything guitar driven, which is what I think mostly within my, within a two year period from 83 to about 85, I really developed into a, a more, you know, guitar based love of music rather than synthesizer. So I got away from pop and, tried to be what I thought was a, a little more discerning and what I enjoyed. Okay. Have you got some examples of other bands apart from big country around that time? Well, this one probably is going to contradict, but I love my big bands. So my, probably my other absolute favorite band. And I think probably the most underrated or underappreciated band of the eighties was big audio dynamite, uh, Mick Jones of the clash form that and that is just a was just a musical revelation for a lot of people i think so i like them my other favorite bands were anything really guitar driven so just i'm, I'm trying to think of anything big country was really my main focus but anything that had a good guitar riff okay van, van halen of course you had to love them in the 80s yeah the, the thing I like about Van Halen myself is I, I really love the, um, the first couple of albums from 78, 79, really like those ones. Did you step back and listen to those or were you listening to more of the, the songs that came off the album 1984? Oh, no, I went back and, well, 84 is what got me into it, particularly the song Panama. You know, that to me is almost the perfect rock song, party rock song. And then of course I went back and, and listened to Diver Down and Van Halen, uh, one and two. And then you just get a sense to the musicianship uh, that they had and the, the structures and the way they put together the song. And I think that's very much what I liked about Big Country was the same thing. It's, it's 
Big Country is a little more sonically dense. You had to wade through it a little bit more where Van Halen was not. It was just, you know, it was a little more, and I think it was the way it was produced. It, it, it just seemed to be a little more upfront. But I like what I liked about Big Winter is they made me work for it because it took me a while, long while, to get into certain songs. But when I finally get it, then you know that's they've got you forever. <laughs> and I had to work hard. I had to work hard at. And there's still some songs out there. But I just I'm sorry, but I'm uh, no place like home is just best left, you know, in the closet. As far as I'm concerned, I'm just. I can't do it. But they'll always because be it linked. wasn't get hard driven for me. They'll always be linked with uh, a flock. Of, I'll I'll never think about you again without thinking about a flock of seagulls. Did you know who was it? Who was it that um, invented the seagull? It was uh, Bruce Watson, wasn't it? Isn't that? He is the seagull. Watch it, guys who are watching it. Didn't Bruce invent the seagull? So. That, that was a comment I believe Stewart made during a concert. Yeah. I like it. Okay, so you, 13 when you heard In a Big Country, um, were you in a position to get your hands on, on the album? You got, the, got your hands on the album? Uh, that came about about three months after I discovered the band. Uh, there were no major stores that sold albums in, in our small town. So we would have to drive about 30 miles to go to Baton Rouge. Uh, we didn't even would go to Baton Rouge. If we could help it, we would try to go to one of the suburbs and they had a store called a TG and Y and the TG and Y, which was just a five and dime had a big country album in the country music section. <laughs> which I very quickly would, would learn to, look there first because no, they just didn't know any better. The clerks didn't know. So that when I found that and that it was just after fields of fire came out uh, as a video. And when fields of fire came out, that was just further proof to me that, that Oh my God, this is the best band ever. I said, I've got to get an album. So when I found the album, of course I bought it. And inevitably being from a small town and not having any connections to the music industry, I would, anytime I would go to a place that sold cassette tapes because CDs were not out and I'd, I was a little bit above albums, I would look for big country. And I just don't think most people know the joy of walking in and not knowing that something is there, will or will not be there. And it was always just whenever I found a big country cassette that I didn't have, it was a genuine just that my day was made. And I don't think we get that a lot anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, I used to, in, I used to also enjoy the times when I'd go into a record store and they'd have a big country section. A lot of the time there'd be no records behind it, but every now and then there would be a big country record behind it. And um, even if I had it, it would, I'd still always look every time I went into a store, I'd look for big country. So um, I didn't even find Wonderland, which was a, a four um, four song EP, until I went to a grocery store in 1984. I was visiting my aunt and uncle, and we were going to the Dallas Grand Prix, or I was going to the Dallas Grand Prix, which is the only Formula One race I ever had. That's golf and Formula One are my two great loves, and. I went into the grocery store and they had a cassette and I came back and listened to it. And Wonderland might've been just the most amazing song I think I'd ever heard. And to this day, it's probably my favorite. Okay. And then, but I think the travel going back to what you were saying about my love of travel and your love of travel, what big countries music always gave for me was a sense that they were wanted to see what was over the next hill musically. And that's sort of my thing. When any time I go to a place, I just want to know what's around the next curve on the road or what's over the next hill. I want to see. And that's, I always felt like their music sort of encouraged that exploration for me because it was such a wide open and expansive, you know, a dense, a very tight sound, but, but, but encourage you to do be exploring. So I really like that about it. 
Just a couple of comments coming through. PK says, Bruce did invent the seagull, and I had the pleasure of mentioning it to Richard Jobson last year when I had the pleasure of hearing an evening with Jobson, with Bruce and Jamie. So what a, what a job I think of that, Pete. Did he just look at you blankly or <laughs> it could just be a big country fan in joke these days? Um, Oliver Hunter, who was on with us last time, good to see you, mate. Um, he says he used to do that too in the record shops, which is look for big country. And he said uh, he used to put them in the front of the section so they could be seen by anyone looking. Yes. I would Actually, the, they had long holders for the cassettes and they, they would be flat. So I would always take the big country and raise it up about two inches so that it was higher than the rest of them. So whenever somebody went through, they would have to look at that. <laughs> so I felt like I was doing my part to help sales. Doing your bit. Yeah. Oh, the, the young'uns of today have no idea of the struggles that we used to have getting our band known back in the day. Do you remember how bad it was when you would play your tape and the batteries would run out and it would destroy the cassette tape? So you, it would slow down the, the words and the music. So then you'd have to go buy another one. And for me, finding another big country tape was an adventure in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tell us a bit more about your big country journey. Like, um, did you did you go looking for Steel Town after that, or was it a few years before you actually became aware that Steel Town was around? Because I don't think they were quite popular in the states after the crossing, were they? Well, Wonderland, the video for Wonderland was quite popular uh, and gained that. I would say that one song probably gained Big Country as many or more fans than In a Big Country did. Um, my own personal opinion is that I don't, and I'm trying to remember what I did. I, I believe I found out about Where the Rose was sung on Radio 1990 when they played that video. And they said off of their new album. So I knew there was a new album. And then it was just a matter of me sourcing it. So anytime I found a new, or saw a new video, or found out on the radio that they said, oh, this is the new song from the new album by Big Country, or if, if I heard a song that I wasn't familiar with, then I knew there was something I should be looking for. Okay. And then we had a, a, a high school radio station, the Baton Rouge High School, you know, had a low-powered radio station that played modern music. And they would have a top 10 list that they put in the newspaper every week. And when the Seer came out, Look Away was in the top 10 for probably two months on their most requested song. So I would look in that section of the paper. We called it the fun section. And any time there was, I would look through, and if I saw Big Country, it was a song I didn't recognize. I knew it was time to go look for an album. Okay. <clears throat> Were you still doing that right up until... Um, we? like Peace in Our Time, for instance. That was the first album that I was actually physically looking for um, when it came out or was expecting when it came out. So were you still... No, it was... I, well, I can still remember discovering the Buffalo Skinners. Um, and that was, what, 93? So mm -hmm. I, I believe I was, that was my first year of teaching. So I'd just gotten out of university and went to the record store and looked under the big country, under the bees for big country and there was this new album and of course I immediately bought it and put it in the cassette deck and listened to it on the way home and had rediscovered my love for big country on that album. That to this day, that's, that's my album there that I don't know. That was the right album at the right time for me. Yeah. And I want to first, as soon as I heard it, the time, just yeah. sorry. Just out of curiosity, what else were you listening to at the time? Because, and I asked that because when Buffalo Skinners came out, I was reasonably heavily into some of the grunge that was out there. I wasn't a huge Nirvana fan, but I liked, I was a really big fan of Soundgarden at the time. So it was the, it was the only kind of way you could get, you know, guitar sounding music was that style at the time. And then Buffalo Skinners came out and uh, blew me away. Well, and... You know, I look back at 1988 or 89, 
um, which is when Peace in Our Time came out. And in my mind, Peace in Our Time just got destroyed by Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses, <laughs> which was sort of the, they may have been the pinnacle hair band, but they didn't rock like a hair band. They were harder than that, but it was still a polished sound. And I think Big Country went overly polished, and I was like, well, that's somewhere in between what, those two albums should have been what Peace in Our Time was. So I was watching MTV, a show they had called 120 Minutes, and they played Smells Like Teen Spirit. And my friends and I were getting ready to go to spring break in Florida. Uh, if anybody knows, doesn't in around the world doesn't know what spring break is, it is uh, the college uh, drink fest slash mating attempt by every male, pretty much on any female with a pulse. <laughs> and you do it at the clubs. And um, I can remember getting in the car and telling my friends, I just heard a song that is, this is the new chain face of music. This is the, mo- this is the best song. I mean, it was, and if really for my generation, I would say that Smells Like Teen Spirit is our version of satisfaction as far as uh, rock songs go. So I got heavily into Nirvana. But my real favorite was Pearl Jam, which was the most big country-like band in terms of sound, I think. Yeah. So I like I liked the grunge. I really did. I loved Soundgarden, but they were, they were heavy, heavy, heavy. They were closer to a more plotting sound. And then when Metallica became uh, essentially commercialized, it's hard not to like the black. The, the opening to Enter Sandman, if there's a better opening to a song, I don't know what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I was, I w- it certainly was one of the ones thrashing the Black Album at the time. And well, when did that came out? Was it, was it, I can't remember. Maybe. Was it 89, was it? Or was I think it, it was in the 90s. It was in the 90s? Maybe 90. Someone, someone I don't. correct us on that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really liked um, Nothing Else Matters as well. So. Really mm, yes. Play the air guitar and scream that one throughout the house too when no one was watching. Okay. <laughs> Got some more comments here. Dan Hayward. Um, you aren't alone in your feelings about No Place Like Home, which I'm sad about because I think that lyrically there's some amazing songs on the album. So what's your favourite studio album? My favourite studio album, Vacillates but it always goes between the Buffalo Skinners and Steel Town. I can remember when Steel Town came out. Well, the crossing actually in Playboy magazine, which my dad used to get, and and I will admit that I only read it for the pictures, but they had a pretty good music review section and Playboy gave Big Country, the crossing, uh, four stars out of four, I believe it was and said it was a wonderful album, but a bit seeming. In other words, and I assume that means if you listen to it multiple times, it just sort of bled into each other. When Steel Town came out, it said it is the first album perfected, but it didn't garner as good reviews. Well, my thought process, and still is, well, if if this was good, and this is a better version of good, then it's great. So I absolutely love Steel Town, except for the song Steel Town. I think that's the weakest song on the whole album. And then the Buffalo Skinners I love. And my favorite song on that is probably Chester's Storm. But I've read where that might be Stewart's least favorite. And I believe I read somewhere that said he'd enjoyed Pink Marshmallow Moon. (laughs) Not my favorite. That's the one I would have left off that album. Yeah, right. Uh, but the, I, I love the two albums. Just I could listen to them, and and I often do listen outside. I listen to them loud, and my neighbors are inclined to enjoy it <laughs> with the volume. I, I play it at. The Walking Encyclopedia Svine has come on and uh, informed us that the Black Album was released in August. Mind August, nineteen ninety one. Hmm. So there you go, early nineties. I had a feeling it was early nineties, but. Could have been 89. It's all so long. It's starting to get so long ago now. All right. I've got a story from Pete Kay. Um, 
to do with travel and big country. Um, he said he was in a he was in Clearwater Beach, Florida, staying in a motel near the beach. Long story short, went to reception to see about extending his stay for one extra day. And of course, he was wearing his big country t shirt on your Pete. Uh, turns out the owner knew of Stuart when he had his place in Florida. Ended up chatting about the band and getting a nice discount on my bill. What a, that's a good story. I like that. Fancy bumping into people that far away who actually know who actually knew of knew of Stuart. Not me. Um, Daniel Newman says, "LSU, go Tigers." <laughs> this is the greatest year of my life. We went undefeated and won our uh, American football college championship, the collegiate championship, which is more important than the NFL for those of us that love collegiate football. So it's sort of to try to explain it to people. It's like the world cup, but except it's important. Very good. It's a, not a matter of life and death. It's much more important than that. <laughs> Tell me a bit about, um, I mean, you don't have to go into a long life history or anything, but I'm curious to know how you, how you, like you've got, you went into teaching. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to know what led you down that path to start with. But then after you finished teaching, you started traveling. So how did that come about and why did you choose to go to the places that you chose? Well, you know, being from a small town in rural Louisiana, you would think that I would be a redneck or a, a bubba or somewhat uncultured. But both of my parents were college educated. My dad traveled in the Navy, and he always uh, made told the story that he once ate with Lord Mountbatten. What it turns out, my dad was stationed in Malta, Lord Mountbatten made an appearance and sat down and had a meal with the troops stationed there, of which my dad was one of. So dad always referred to him, his dinner with Dickie, which I thought was always very funny. But we always had National Geographic magazines. Uh, my favorite book growing up, and when I was 10 years old, 1980, my parents gave me a National Geographic atlas, uh, which was just this huge book. I've broken the spine on looking at it. I love to travel. I want to see what's over the next hill. I want to know what's over the next corner. And I don't want to go. I'm the kind of vacationer that my perfect vacation is to go to some place, not on a tour, but then rent a car, drive around. If something looks interesting to me, I pull over and stop and go see it. Um, that that's just my idea. I really want an on the ground viewpoint of the world. People say I've been to Jamaica or I've been to Mexico, but I never left the resort. Well, then have you really been to a place? So my parents encouraged that. And at age 13, they gave me an opportunity to, uh, through a club called 4-H. So again, that's a very rural American thing. I had a chance to go to Japan and I lived with a Japanese host family for about five weeks. So at 13, I was in Japan by myself with no English speakers um, traveling. And that really whetted my appetite. Later on, um, because I married a Belgian, we went, of course, to visit her family and toured around Europe a little bit. Um, then professionally, I was working at the Louisiana State University, the LSU Laboratory School. And we were doing the IB curriculum. And this is kind of an interesting story. Um, I'm reading my, um, reading an article about cardamom because I'm teaching an economics class and I wanted to use spice as a currency, just as an example. And as I'm reading that, there was an article by the Aramco, Saudi Aramco, the oil company. They have a magazine called World Magazine. So I read this article. Well, 10 minutes later, I get an email saying there's a fellowship by the Saudi Aramco oil company to go for a three week visit to Saudi Arabia. I said, that is serendipity. I've got to fill out that application. I went 
and was uh, actually I filled it out, was selected to attend the trip, made some lifelong friends with fellow teachers, and we've spent two and a half to three weeks touring Saudi, and this is post 9-11. They, want, they wanted us to understand not all Saudis were like that. When I came back to my now ex-wife, she said, would you ever live and work in Saudi? And I said, I would do it anywhere but Riyadh. Well, a year and a half later, we took jobs in Riyadh. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> we left that school. That school was not what they advertised. They were not an international school. It was really a Saudi royal family school. And our children were not getting the education they needed because most of the students there spoke Arabic as opposed to English as a first language. So we moved to Malawi because we were on the international teaching circuit. And then from there, uh, I ended up coming back here. But while there, my son and I got into our Nissan patrol and we did a tour of Southern Africa. So we drove from the long way into Zambia and went to Victoria Falls and then drove across the bridge into Zimbabwe. So I've been to every country in the world that starts with a letter Z. <laughs> And we crossed into Botswana and uh, spent a lot of time in Maui, which was famous for the Top Gear special they did there. And then we drove back. And my mother, not really knowing, said, oh, it looks close on a map. And I would have to explain to her, there's big and there's Africa big. So, you know, there was that, that love of travel. My son and I have also been down to Argentina. So if anybody's never been to Argentina, I can't recommend that highly enough. It's just the most beautiful place. And then, you know, I think travel opens up your eyes to a lot of the world. And it is just something I absolutely love. I'm considering doing a trip this summer uh, called the Central Asia Rally. If anybody wants to look that up, it's Central Asia, Central Asia Rally com. It's not a real race, but just an opportunity to tour. So I'm, I'm considering doing that. So there's always a, another adventure. And. That's just kind of who I am. That's what I do. I'll sacrifice things at home in order to do a big trip like that. Oh, that sounds, that sounds absolutely awesome. You mentioned that you'd been to every continent except Australia. When are you getting here? I've got the frequent flyer miles. It, I checked it out two days ago. It would be about, it would cost me a grand total of $58 to get there. So, it's a matter of me just making that jump. My son graduates from high school in, in two years, so I have to go to, to Europe for that. And I think once that's done, I think Australia will definitely be, the, be my next big vacation. But I plan on coming down and getting one of your Holdens with the V8 supercharged engine and just stay off the road because I'm coming, baby. <laughs> you scared me. Oh, I, I can drive on both sides of the road with equal amounts of, of disdain for pedestrians. <laughs> uh, very good. Excellent. I, I've, and I do know how to drive a standard because I, I learned that in, in the long way. Like, well, I know how to drive a standard anyway, but to drive it on the incorrect side of the road. So with all your travel, have you ever, ever had a chance to bump into big country while you've been traveling? No more so than, than what I've kind of related. Uh, one time in Belgium, we went to a movie theater and they were playing songs prior to the movie. And Look Away came on. And just as the music, the, the vocals started, they cut it off and began the movie, which kind of irritated me. I was thinking you could have waited just three more minutes. <laughs> but I've uh, heard it on the radio. Just to see them. <laughs> even now in America or anywhere it, it, when I can play the music and enjoy it, but it's so much more satisfying when I hear it on the radio. So um, my question is, have you ever had a chance to see big country play live? And Dan asks, um, are you planning to be able to take any of the scheduled U S dates? So I guess the closest one to you would be the joint headline with, with Berlin down in um, Miami. I think it is. Uh, that's a good question. I, I would more likely go to the San Francisco show. And if there was any way they would be open, um, to having a show in 
here, I, I've got the money to put it on. I don't know how to do all that, but I'm fortunate in that I can kind of indulge certain fantasies uh, because ultimately it would mitigate some of the cost on it. But uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I've never seen them. The only time I had a chance, they came to New Orleans when I was 13 and they did a show on the riverboat president where I believe Bruce got arrested. Uh, I sort of remember a story about that. That, that is no longer a venue. And they came back in 1993 on the Buffalo Skinners tour. But my best friend Hatcher, who is a huge big country fan, his grandmother had died and the funeral was the same day. And if I have to make a choice between going to see big country or being there to support my best friend and, and his family, then I'm, I've made a choice I'm comfortable with. So no, I've never had the opportunity to see him live. Okay. So you, you said that you'd go to San Francisco. Any chance of that? Because I was actually considering going to San Francisco myself. I've been looking at flights and waiting for the cheap ones to come up, and I thought I could jump over there for a few days. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't know the dates, but I've got enough sick days built up at work that I could give myself a day if I felt like it. I, 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 and I love San Francisco. It's the greatest city in America. So, it, you know, any chance to go out there and, and, and just to experience that city, it, it's always a, a joy to go there. But, but yeah, that, what, I, what are the dates? Because I'd love to find out. I, uh, I think it's around the 13th, 13th or 14th of February they're, they're playing San Francisco. Then they're playing another they're – playing, they're playing San Francisco the first night. Then they're playing um, out somewhere near uh, Sacramento the next okay. – and then they're, they're playing L.A. the night after that. So three nights in a row in northern California. Well, kind of northern L.A. Um, yeah. All right. But no, I have to take a look at the dates. Someone put the, someone put the dates in the comments for me so I don't have to look it up. I'm too lazy. Come on. I'll be honest. I, I'm, I knew they were coming, but I mean, I, I've just been very busy with graduate school. I, you know, I don't, don't look at it that closely, uh, but I, I have decided that I, I have, I have there's, at this point in my life, at 49 years of age, I deserve to give myself a couple of treats, and that, that definitely could be one of them. Yeah, it's, and being only a few weeks away, I say do it. Is everyone else that's watching live, should we get behind Worth here and say, get up there to San Francisco. Go and see your favourite band because you will not be disappointed. Yeah, I would, you know, and this is a, I, I really would love to see them. Uh, to be honest with you, I guess this is somewhere it's something I need to tread carefully on. For me, big country kind of stopped when Stewart died. Uh, I, I do not deny any person their right to ply their trade, and I certainly think Mark and and Bruce have uh, earned the right to tour with the big country name. And Derek, I'm I'm, I'm uh, Facebook friends uh, with Scott. Uh, he is such a neat guy and such a talented photographer, enjoy seeing his stuff. Love to just meet him and shake his hand. All of them, really. Jamie, or they, they all seem like great guys. And, and I would love to go see them. But, you know, it for me, it will not take – I will sing the band, but it will not be the big country I grew up with. So there, there will always be a regret that I didn't get to see them in their original form. I absolutely hear what you're saying. However, I will say – and they're playing at the chapel in San Francisco on the 13th, by the way. I just looked it up. And I'm making notes there. So I, I would recommend you see them. But I hear what you're saying about the lineup, but there is something extra special about hearing these songs performed live, which is where they're meant to be performed. It's something that you can never, you can never begin to experience. Even with the current lineup, there is still something pretty magical, pretty special. So I say do it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's the sort of thing I'm looking for. Um, the live without the aid of a safety net concert that's on YouTube that you can find the videos of is just so magical to watch. Um, I, I always wondered if Bruce gets tired of playing the rhythm guitar on Wonderland because he works hard on that song. He's, he's busy. And I thought, you know, I'd love just to see that effort that he put into it that night to see if that's still there. 
and you know uh, the, the new lead singer uh, is, is it Simon? Simon. Simon, yeah. It, that what a peculiarly Stewart like voice he's got. I don't think they could have done any better. No, no. I can I can say one hundred percent. You will not regret it if you do it. Um, and it uh, will certainly be something you can check off your bucket list. So if you're in a position to jump up to San Fran, how far is it there? About five or six hours on the plane? Uh, yeah, I would have to fly to Houston uh, or, or to Dallas probably and then another about a three-and-a-half-hour flight from there to San Francisco. So Oliver is saying um, it's great to hear the songs played live. You should definitely go. You won't regret it. Den says do it. You definitely won't be disappointed. The current lineup and what they deliver respectfully pays homage to Stuart and his musical legacy. Trust me, Simon is superb. And uh, they're all superb. Absolutely. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. <clears throat> and I think they should be be is into and, and loving of the music is I know uh, Bruce and Mark are, and as long as the rest of the guys are, are trying to put on a good show and, and, and feel the music, then I don't know how you could have a bad show. So that just sounds like something that would be a lot of fun. I just, I've never really had too much of an opportunity. So I do, I guess I need to go ahead and avail myself of that chance while I have the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And personally, I'd much prefer to see them in a show um, where they're, the soul act and headlining then go down and see them with, but although I would go to, I would go to Florida and see them with Berlin for sure. But um, yeah, there's something special about them being their own main headline act. Um, Alan, thanks. You looked up the tour dates. I know it's on bigcountry.co.uk. I was just too lazy to look it up until no one answered. I mean, I did look it up. So Alan, um, Alan Ambari, he's in, he's next door in Texas. Um, he says, um, he, I agree with Oliver and Dwayne. It's amazing to hear these songs live. Uh, is it the same as the old days? No, but there's still a lot of magic there. It must be seen and heard live to be believed. Best, best concert I ever saw. And I think Alan saw the, um, the lineup with Mike Peters. So yeah, it, there's, there's something, something special. Keith, uh, <clears throat> Keith Lewington says the current lineup have certainly found their feet. Steel Town Tour sounded excellent. They maintain complete respect for Stuart. So I think everyone's behind you, Worth. I want you to get up there, get to San Francisco on the 13th. It's only a couple of weeks away. You're going to love it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, you know, I don't want anybody to misconstrue the idea that they're doing something, that I think they're doing something they should not be. Uh, it just, you know it's one of those deals where I think you guys probably have convinced me that, that maybe it's not the same, but the songs are still the same. And as long as they're played with the passion and the, and the energy, that, uh, you know, that I, it's not, I guess that's what the music is about. That's why we listen to them is we love the music. Yeah. We may love the guys in the band, maybe not, but we, the music is something special and that's you, what you I will mean. uh you will enjoy watching bruce i tell you. you you said uh he works hard on wonderland well he doesn't just work hard he enjoys it too and you can see it um and that's uh, that's a pleasure to watch i tell you to to watch him enjoying playing these songs so much um uh is is certainly a treat but you know the that concert when he does <laughs> the solo at in a big country um that to me is the finest guitar work kind of break during a song that I've ever heard. Listening to the album of without uh, a safety net, I always thought that was two guitars. I thought they were Bruce and Stewart were going back and forth. I never realized that was just Bruce getting it done by himself. I mean, I, to this day, that just, you know, it gets me in the gut. It really does. I just, I absolutely love that. That's that version of the song. Well, thanks very much, Worth, for, for coming on. And once again, I apologise for, for sleeping in. Um, it's just what I do. It's just what I do. It's, it's, it's um, <laughs> oh, come on, everyone, give me a break. I'm always getting up at these ridiculous times to, to help everyone else out. 
maybe someone should come on at midnight for me sometime. Is that going to happen? Maybe, maybe not. But yeah, thanks, Worth. I really appreciate it. You know, it was a lot of fun, and, and thanks for having me. I uh, really do appreciate the, all the guys out there, particularly the people that do the other big country podcast and uh, keep everybody up to date. You know, it really is neat that there's something out there that people that may have nothing in common, may never meet each other, but we've got something that we all can hold and, and, and share commonality with. I mean, what a great special thing we have. Thanks, Worth. Appreciate that. It's uh, It's been a pleasure. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate it. For me. If you believe your own black and darky, in Saudi Arabia and one of the things you can do is something called dune bashing which is taking four by fours and drive them through the dunes and going off-roading and you know you can do it with four wheelers but we had a Ford F-150 V8 supercharged engine you know with four-wheel drive that made it a lot of fun and of course the in a big country video has them in the boats and whatnot and I decided to put that song on because we had, uh, at the time, it was like something that went in a cigarette lighter that held songs. And it would, you could play on the radio. So we put on In a Big Country, and I was just dune bashing and flying over sand dunes. And, uh, you know, just kids were in the back of the truck. It, probably not the safest or smartest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but we had a heck of a good time. Just blaring Big Country in the middle of the Saudi desert. Oh, wow. That could have been a new video clip for it. Uh, uh, if we had had a drone, it would have been really cool. <laughs>